Sasha, can you use? Okay. I started, Elena, I started. Okay. Uh, um, so I'm going to tell you in, in, in these two lectures um, about four dimensional Chern Simons theory. And we're going to see uh, how a lot of the structures that I talked about yesterday, both in string theory and in integrability, um, emerge from the four dimensional uh, Chern Simons point of view. But just to convince you that four dimensional Chern Simons theory is not uh, such a weird beast. Uh, I'm going to um, start with talking about parallels between 3D Chern Simons theory and 4D Chern Simons theory. And, and so sometimes when I'm going to say something, I'm going to switch to 3D Chern Simons theory, and then I might switch back um, and, and, and show you how there are a lot of similarities. Broadly speaking, the idea is meant to be that 4D Chern Simons theory is just another gauge theory. Um, and you can calculate in it just like you do perturbatively uh, in any other gauge theory. Now, of course, it has some peculiarities. It's a little bit uh, different from your conventional four-dimensional gauge theories that you used to. For example, it does not have uh, Lorentz invariance in four dimensions. Um, but it'll have all the right symmetries that we want uh, for integrable one plus one dimensional theories. And yet, so it's going to be a perfectly nice four-dimensional uh, gauge theory, uh, or, or as nice as or as nice as it um, needs to be. Um, okay, so I'm going to start slowly. Um, please interrupt me if there are any questions or ask me questions on chat. Uh, so I guess let's um, remind everyone. Um, that the churn simons action, um, it's an action that looks like this. So there is no metric. You have an ADA term, which is the kinetic term, first order term, and a, a term that makes, um, and a cubic interaction term. Now throughout this talk, I noticed as I was writing the transparencies that I often dropped the trace. So I hope that doesn't confuse people. Um, and the uh, gauge field is just a one form, right? In three directions. And it uh, takes values in some Lie algebra. So this is a pretty simple gauge theory. We can, uh, with, uh, for now, kappa just a coupling constant. So we could work out what are its equations of motion. Again, because I know I have a mixture of uh, uh, a mixed a mixed audience with some people who are more advanced and some people who are less advanced. So um, let's just have a quick look at how this works out. So we vary the action um, and you either vary A or you vary DA. Um, um, and then the cubic term looks like this. Now integrating by parts, you would just get an equation like this. And this is, this you recognize straight away as F the field strength. Um, and the equation of motion just says the field strength is equal to zero. So that's a pretty simple uh, gauge theory if you want. Uh, all the uh, gauge fields, have, all the solutions have got to be pure gauge. So you have to be able to write them in terms of G minus one DG. That's what makes it pure gauge. Um, and G here is a, a valued in the group very similar to what we saw yesterday with the principal chiral model, except that now X runs over three uh, directions of the three-dimensional space-time. So because of this condition, right, there are no local degrees of freedom. There's no photons, and no gluons. Now, you can check, and I'll leave this as an exercise. So you take this action, and you can check uh, that it's invariant under infinitesimal gauge transformations. So if you vary A in this way, where epsilon is some local function uh, valued in the Lie algebra, um, then the action is invariant up to some total derivative terms. And for now, we're going to consider um, no boundary contributions, so the action is invariant. So you might think, okay, fine, that's it. That's a, a, a very nice gauge theory, but there's a subtlety here. I'm sure a lot of you know this, but let me just state it anyway. The 
The subtlety is that if you consider non-infinitesimal gauge transformations, so an infinitesimal transformation is one where G is e to the epsilon for some small epsilon. Uh, but if you consider large gauge transformations, so a general gauge transformation would look like this, the Lagrangian is not actually gauge invariant. So that's another nice exercise that you might want to do or ask me about on Slack. Um, just insert this expression into the action, and you'll notice that, as well as some total derivatives, there's actually a term like this. So you might not recognize uh, this term, um, but on the other hand, if you did study a little bit of topology, you'll see that this is actually the winding number for this function g of x. So uh, it's the, how much the, the, the function g of x, which takes values in the Lie group, winds around the three-dimensional space. Come with a bit more work, so it's not really important for us here, but I just want to say that you could you can work out what are the right boundary conditions at infinity, and you can work out what is the correct normalization of this winding number density. And, and because it's a winding number up to some factors, um, it is actually an integer. So there's this well-known uh, um, story in, in the Chern-Simons action that actually the action is not invariant under large gauge transformations. But that's not a disaster, turns out, because you're not really interested in the action, you're interested in the exponential of the action. And that's gauge invariant um, as long as you make this guy proportional to 2 pi i times an integer. And what that translates to is that what you thought was a coupling constant, kappa, is actually an integer divided by 4 pi. So if you're thinking about Chern Simons theory non perturbatively, it means you cannot treat kappa as a coupling constant in the sense of you know, being able to, to do perturbation in it. But that's something that you only think of when you, when you think of the theory uh, globally or non-perturbatively. In perturbation theory, um, when you're doing Feynman diagrams in Chern-Simons theory, you really do treat kappa uh, as, a, a, as a coupling constant. You expand in it, you calculate diagrams and interactions. Um, in exactly the same way as if kappa was just a general uh, coupling constant. And then when you've done your calculating, you have to set it to an integer. Okay, so that's one property of uh, three-dimensional Chern-Simons theory. And we're going to see a slight variation of this in four-dimensional Chern-Simons theory. Now, another point I wanted to just highlight very briefly before we get into the main part of the talk, is that you might think that chern simons couplings, if you're a string theorist, are kind of weird. Why would I, you know, I've got D brains, D brains have got some kind of super young Mills uh, gauge theory living on them. So they, they would have a usual Maxwell kinetic term. So why would I be interested as a string theorist in chern simons couplings? But actually, chern simons couplings show up all the time in string theory as well. So of course, uh, here's a way you can see that. You all know that the fundamental string can then on a D3 brain. And in particular, if I think of both of these objects as semi-classical excitations, I could have the fundamental string, for example, in the 0, 3 direction and the D3 in the 4, 5, and 6 directions. And if I do an S duality, I get a D1, D3 system. So that's got four Neumann Dirichlet boundary conditions. That's a quarter VPS, just a, about as simple an intersecting brain system as you want. And let's do one other thing, which is let's do a, another t-duality um, so that the d1, d3 now becomes, we're doing t-dualities in two directions, it becomes a d3, d5. Okay. And the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do an s-duality so the d3 brain remains exactly as it was, and the d5 brain becomes another Schwartz 5 brain. Okay. So I've done all this uh, gymnastics. Uh, just to show you that a D3 brain can end on a Neve Schwartz 5 brain. So I guess maybe if you knew that a priori, then you know you, you secretly knew all these S and T dualities, but certainly we all know that a fundamental string can end on a D3 brain. That's kind of the point of D brains. Um, and that's uh, S and T dual or U dual to a D3 brain ending on a Neve Schwartz 5 brain. So why, why is that such a nice configuration? 
Well, remember, uh, the free brains have got this Vesumino coupling. Uh, so here, C is just the sum over all the Ramon Ramon potentials. And here is the exponential of the gauge field. And in particular, what you could do is you could um, expand to quadratic order in F. So there are other terms here, which I am ignoring, but we're only interested in this term. So now, so there is such a term, right? There is such a coupling on the B3 brain well volume over here. But if I take a constant um, axiom, then I can integrate, uh, then this guy uh, F wedge F is actually a total derivative. It's just uh, D of the churn simons form. That's in fact, I think how uh, churn and simons originally thought about uh, uh, such a free form. Um, and so if you integrate this, uh, you end up with a boundary term just at the intersection of the D3 and the Neves Schwartz 5 brain, and it's precisely a Chern Simons type couple. So I've gone through this, and, and these are some of the kinds of configurations that Gaiotto and Witten studied a few years ago. But I've gone through this just to motivate that Chern Simons couplings do appear in string theory, they're quite natural. Uh, and so, you know, you might be interested in, in finding out about them uh, for that reason. So that's kind of my lightning introduction into uh, 3D churn simons theory. I'm sure most of you know this already. But let's now do something hopefully a little bit less familiar, which is four-dimensional churn simons theory. So you see right away with four-dimensional churn simons theory, the first question is, what on earth do you mean by that? Right? The churn simons form ADA plus two-thirds A cubed does not depend on a metric, it's just proportional to the volume form of three-dimensional space. And so you might wonder, well, how can you do four-dimensional churn simon sphere? And uh, I guess uh, Kevin uh, showed a very beautiful way of, of defining a kind of churn simon sphere in four dimensions. And, and there are other, churn simon spheres do pop up in other dimensions in general, and people have studied them in various uh, topological string theory settings. There are holomorphic churn simon spheres, which live on Lagrangian submanifolds in, in uh, Calabiaus and so on. Um, so people have played with these ideas uh, uh, for a while, but I think this formulation here that, that, that Kevin uh, uh, developed a few years ago is, is particularly nice and, you know, for, for what we're doing, namely for these integrable backgrounds. Okay, so you take the churn simons free form and you just declare that you're going to wedge it with some pre-specified uh, one form omega, okay? So the integrand now is a four form, so that's good. We can integrate it over four dimensions. And what we're going to do is we're going to think of these four dimensions as a product of a Riemann surface times a complex curve. And I want to just set some notation that I'm going to be using throughout. Um, the Riemann surface is going to have coordinates w and w bar, and the complex curve is going to have coordinates z and z bar. And eventually, these guys are going to be the string world sheet. And this guy is going to be the spectral parameter that appears in the, all these integrable constructions. If you remember this lax that we had, had some complex number, which I variously called u or z uh, yesterday. And so this is going to be that guy. OK. Now. What should this one form look like? So, in fact, we're always going to take it to be in the z direction. So it's just going to have a z component. But depending on all of the interest, all of the interesting differences and all of the variety, if you want, will come from picking different one forms. So they will always be in the dz direction, but they can be, uh, we, we can make different choices of what they will be. Okay, so let's see what our action actually looks like, right? Here is uh, just my one form. It's got four components, 
this is the connection. But if I wedge it with omega and omega is in the dz direction, well, you see that the dz 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 wedge dz is zero. So you get rid of the az component. So the az component never appears in this action. No az component. So that's quite unusual, right? And one way you could think about this, other than me just showing you that this is how it works, is you could think that there is an additional gauge symmetry. Here it is. You can, re you can check that the action is invariant under changing A uh, to uh, any function chi times the one form dz. So the action is invariant under this. And then we can work in the gauge where Az is equal to 0. Okay. So Either way, for now, I'm going to take omega in most of this lecture, as opposed to the one after the break, I'm going to take omega to be just dz. Okay, so what have we done is we have defined a four dimensional gauge theory. There is a coupling constant h out front, and there is a partial connection, right? Why partial connection? Well, it's not a total connection because we don't have the az component. And we've broken Lorentz invariance. But we have two dimensional Lorentz invariants in the WW bar. Let me just pause here and see if people have any questions, comments. Okay. So, a nice exercise to do if you haven't done these kinds of things before is to find what the equations of motion are. And that's really very similar to how we did it in the three-dimensional case, so I won't go over that here. You can ask me on Slack. But basically, you discover that you have three equations of motion. The WW bar component of the field strength has to be zero. The WZ bar and W bar Z bar components also, but there is no equation, for example, like WZ equal to zero, simply because we don't have an AZ component. Right? We only have three components um, of the gauge field. So the, the first one of these equations looks very familiar from normal chern silence theory. Namely, it just says that A is topological on this, uh, so the connection A W A W bar on, this, on, on the Riemann surface sigma is uh, just topological. The gauge field is, is the F is equal to zero. On the other hand, these two equations, a good way to think about them is that the covariant z bar derivative of aw, I mean, this is exactly the same equation as this one, and the covariant z bar derivative of aw bar are both zero. And so what this means is that a is holomorphic as you move around in the, uh, the um, complex curve C. So as you're moving in the z z bar directions, your connection changes holomorphic. Okay, so all of this is still classical. Nothing really has uh, happened at a quantum level, but um, I guess Kevin really likes uh, BV quantization, and you know he he has quite a rigorous way of defining perturbative gauge theories using this. Uh, he's developed this over the years, and and the remarkable thing is that it turns out that this quantum theory, th this theory is a well-defined quantum theory to all orders in H. Now this is something you would not expect. Right. If you just wrote down uh, this action and you did some dimensional analysis, well, you can see that, of course, uh, um, A has got to have, uh, you know, it, it's a geometrical field, so it's got to have dimension one over length. Um, and, and so H has got dimension, whoops, I did not want to do that, sorry. H has got to, to have dimension one over length as well. Um, and so you would think that this, this is not a very nice quantum theory. But so it's, it's free in the IR, but it's very heavily interacting in the UV. Um, but actually, perturbatively, it is still well defined. And that's because you cannot write down any gauge invariant counterterms. They all have local counterterms. They all vanish uh, uh, because of the equations of motion. So any gauge invariant local term you write down will involve an F and those Fs are zero. That's kind of a quickened, uh, quickened uh, uh, way of, of saying that why this is a well-defined quantum theory, but 
you can then go ahead and, and, and talk to a mathematician and, 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 and they'll do a full proper BV quantization that'll prove that. But as physicists, I think all we can think about is, okay, supposing there were some divergences, then I should be able to introduce order by order, uh, some uh, um, counter terms. What possible counter terms can I write down? Well, there are no counter terms at the moment. So let's start uh, doing some calculations in this quantum field. Sorry, First I... thing we can do uh, is we can calculate the propagate. So here is, um, so, so if you want to calculate the propagator, what you're going to have to do is figure out what is a, a, a gauge that you want to impose, which, which gauge you want to work in. And here's sort of the analog of the Lorentz gauge. So the exterior derivative D for us um, is perfectly normal, conventional defined in dx and dy, but remember it shouldn't have a dz component. Um, and so the adjoint operator, you can just do a little exercise, you can check what is the adjoint operator um, to this kind of mixed uh, Deram Dolbo uh, differential. And, and this is the, and this is the uh, adjoint operator, this one here, D, I've called it D dagger. Uh, and and the, the one good gauge you might want to work in is the gauge where D dagger A is equal to zero. Uh, Bogdan, I think, uh, you... I think there's a raised hand. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I just missed uh, for uh, the form omega. That is it fixed or does it obey the equations of motion? What uh, what are the equations? The form omega uh, in this lecture is just dz. Uh, equal to dz, not proportional to dz. I see. Okay. In this lecture, but you're right. I I was saying also that sometimes there could be an omega z here and that will be a given thing with some poles and some zeros in in the z plane so in 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 the next lecture that's what we're going to do but it doesn't have any dependence on a thanks any more questions uh is it possible to work with like gauge in theory Yes, you can pick other gauges, absolutely. But have you have, have anybody studied the Lycon gauge quantization of uh, 4D consignments? Well, uh, not in published work, I guess, because um, the number of papers on this is uh, still quite small. But I think people have certainly thought about it. Um, it's quite a natural gauge to consider. Um, maybe I'm being a little bit too rash. Maybe uh, there are some papers of Benoit Vicedo. I should check. Uh, where they sometimes set one of the components of the gauge field to zero. So perhaps that's not quite a light cone gauge, but it's a bit more of a Coulomb gauge. Thank you. But in principle, absolutely. Uh, you know, you should adapt your gauge to whatever is the best, uh, you know, to whatever problem you need. So yeah, it's kind of fun, right? You can, you can go ahead and, and study it in different gauges and see what happens, right? See what new information you can learn and how all that changes. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite fun. Okay, so let me now uh, remind you, I thought what I would do is show, remind you of something that perhaps you know from three-dimensional churn simons theory. There's a very sort of slick and elegant way of finding the propagator there. Well, in 3D churn simons theory, uh, we want the two-point function. Um, and this, of course, has to be a two-form. And it'll depend on the difference of the positions. Now, what kind of two-form is it? Well, of course, we're after a Green's function uh, of, the, uh, um, of the kinetic operator that appears in the action. So we want to, when we take a D of this uh, two form, we would like to have a delta function. And, and this is one of these um, differential form delta functions. So it's a three form actually, right? Because you take a D over D of a two form and, and, and so uh, you get a three form. And not only do we want this uh, Green's function identity, but we would also like to be able to, when we do a D, D uh, dagger, the adjoint operator, we want that to be equal to zero because we're working in this Lorentz gauge. Okay, 
So remember, in three dimensions, d dagger is just star d star, right? That's just uh, how, how Hodge theory works. Um, and the other thing I guess that we all know is that in three dimensions, the scalar Green's function is just one over R. So scalar Green's function is one over R. That means that when you act on box with it, the Laplacian, um, you get a delta function and you get a scalar delta function. But in fact, um, the box is again from just Hodge theory, right? We all know this. Uh, you can write it as D, D dagger plus D dagger D. Um, and because we are a scalar here, uh, D dagger is uh, zero on it, right? When you take the adjoint, you are decreasing the degree of the differential form. Um, and you started off with a scalar with a zero uh, form, so you can't have a minus one form. So you only get the second term contributing. Now there's a Hodge star outside, and if we do a do a Hodge duality on both sides of this equation, then we will get a free form here. It's still a delta function, but it's a, a free form of support on a delta function. Um, and the left hand side is just D of some stuff. So maybe this is our propagator, and in fact it is uh, from the Chern Simons theory. Um, you only have to check. So you, 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 we, we check this equation and you can also see that d star on it is zero and that's kind of trivial uh, because sorry d dagger because d dagger here it is here is star d you know that doing the Hodge dual twice apart from some minus signs gives you um, gives you one uh, and then you're just left with two exterior derivatives so this is zero so that's it we found uh, our uh, 3d chern simons theory propagator and if you we're a bit uncomfortable with the um, differential form notation. Here it is in components. Okay, you see a star d of the scalar um, of the scalar Green's function. Now you can do exactly the same calculation in four-dimensional Chern Simons. Just a, you have to be a little bit careful, and so I've avoided doing it here because there are various annoying factors of a half and two because um, the differential operator D that appears in this action is a combination of a Duran and a, and a Bilbo um, differential operator, and so, and so there's some annoying factors of, of, of two that show up. But all you have to do is to check that you, this is the right answer, um, you just differentiate uh, with the, do an exterior derivative, remembering to wedge with dz because it's really dz wedge d that appears as the kinetic operator in this chern simon theory. And, and you can very quickly show that this gives you the, the four-dimensional delta function. And similarly, the correct um, uh, gauge fixing condition is d star, uh, d dagger here with this annoying factor of four. Okay. So, yeah, I guess, all I really want you to take from this, unless you want to go through the exercises, is that the D operator that appears in the action is invertible, but really it's a combination of DZ wedge D, so that um, you have kind of a Duran piece in the sigma directions, and you have a Dolbo piece in the C direction. But it's still an invertible operator, as long as you pick your gauge right. Okay, any questions about this? Good, so let's now uh, ask about chern simons observables in, and, and what, what kind of observables do these theories have? Well, even in 3D chern simons theory and in 4D chern simons theory, well, there are no local observables, right? As, as, we've just been, as I've just been saying, F is equal to zero, so you can't write down any gauge invariant local operators, but, Famously, there in 3D Chern Simons theory, there are Wilson loops. So Wilson loops are like Wilson lines, but of course they're looped, so they're closed. And the reason we consider closed Wilson loops uh, as opposed to Wilson lines, typically in a normal gauge theory, is that a Wilson line is not really gauge invariant, right? At the endpoints, if you do a gauge transformation, the endpoints transform and non-trivially under a gauge transformation. And so if instead you close the loop, then you can cancel those two contributions. You have a G and a G dagger. 
So I leave that as a little exercise um, for students who might want to do this. Um, but in Chern Simons theory, the theory in 3D Chern Simons, I should say, 3D Chern Simons, um, the theory is topological. So that means you can deform this contour however you want. And because f is equal to zero, um, the correlation function for a Wilson line, for a Wilson loop rather, sorry, will be the same uh, if you've deformed the, 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 upper, uh, the Wilson loop or not. Now, what you cannot do, however, is if you have a configuration on the left-hand side, like two Wilson loops, which sort of go through each other, you cannot go, one, one loop cannot go through the other because that's changing the topology, right? You can move these loops around however you want to, but you cannot move one through the other. And this is this really famous result of Wittens who showed that um, the, the, the correlation functions of Wilson lines give you quantum knot invariance, right? This is how uh, I guess people in the, in the 80s got really excited about uh, Chern Simons theory or one of the reasons. Um, and, 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 you know, you, there, are, there are these famous Rademeister moves in Chern Simons theory, where you can where you can take um, a strand in a knot, this strand over here, and you can move it to the other side as long as, if you can see, I don't know, I didn't draw this very well, but but this strand that I'm indicating here in blue is at the bottom of the knot, and 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 we just move it underneath uh, the knot, and so that's one of the Rademeister moves. And you're allowed to do this from the point of view of the three-dimensional chern simons theory, because this bottom Wilson line, or Wilson loop rather, so it ends somewhere, it goes around somewhere, um, but, but it doesn't intersect the other two. So this is, and all the other Rademeister moves have the same kind of description. So again, I've, I've just gone over a little bit of what happens in three chern simons theory. Uh, hopefully this is familiar to people, but if, if not, it's kind of fun. Uh, to remind oneself about it. Um, and now maybe we can go to four-dimensional chern simons theory. So in four-dimensional chern simons theory, it turns out that the observables that you can have are a type of Wilson line, but they're a bit more subtle than, than in 3D chern simons theory. So first of all, there's just a simple observation that because we don't have an AZ component, we really can only write down these uh, Wilson lines in the WW bar directions. And classically, at least, they're going to sit at a fixed point in the ZZ bar directions. And that's because we cannot do any parallel transport. We only have a partial connection in the, in the C, along the curve C. OK. Well, the other thing that's kind of unusual about them is, um, is that we will be actually interested in open Wilson lines. So Wilson lines that go on all the way to infinity and minus infinity in this WW bar plane. And the reason these guys are uh, gauge invariant is because we have an IR free theory. So that means that at large distances in the IR, the gauge connection goes to zero. And, and so if you want, all, and, and, and as do the, the, the gauge variations, um, and so uh, an infinitely long Wilson line is actually a gauge invariant operator. So those two points are relatively clear, I hope. Um, but then there is a third point, which I'm going to get to a little bit later on, which is that those, this Wilson line is going to be more complicated uh, than a normal Wilson line. Not only are we going to take um, it's to take values in the Lie algebra, but it's going to take values in the polynomial ring above the uh, uh, Lie algebra. So all that means is just polynomials in Z. So it's going to be like T0 plus T1Z plus T2Z squared up to some nth order, some final nth order for, for a given Wilson line. Um, and it'll turn out that these are going to be the correct objects to study um, in, the, in the quantum theory. So I'm going to say a little bit more about this. I just wanted to highlight it here. Okay. But now let me, let me start convincing you that you can do calculations in this gauge field. So, for example, let's consider um, our, oops, 
let's consider our um, a complex curve to be just C. Um, this has a unique vacuum. We can just set in the, in the background vacuum is just A equal to zero, and we can start computing Feynman diagrams. So here are some uh, calculation we could do. In purple, I have tried to draw the Wilson lines, three Wilson lines um, crossing in some places. And then I've tried to draw some gluons um, going between the Wilson lines. You know, we've just calculated the propagator. We should be able to, you know, calculate what is the correlation function of these Wilson lines uh, with this gluon uh, propagator inserted. Now, I've drawn two types of uh, uh, gluons, ones that um, go between two Wilson lines that don't cross each other, and this one where they do cross each other. So now, if they don't cross each other, remember, um, we have diffeomorphism invariants, scale, so we can scale the metric on sigma. So in particular, we can scale up the metric far, far, far away so that this becomes longer and longer and longer. And remember, the theory is IR3. So the longer it becomes, the longer this, uh, <laughs> the distance between the, the propagator, uh, between the endpoints of the propagator is, A will go to zero. So this diagram just goes away. It has to go away because of the diffeomorphism of scale invariance that you have in the sigma language. But you can't play this trick for this gluon. That's because no matter how much you scale up the distance in sigma, there's always going to be some part of the, of the propagator when you calculate that's localized near the intersection point uh, of these two Wilson lines. And this is quite a beautiful picture that, that Costello, Witten, and Yamazaki developed um, because it shows, you see how a quantum field theory calculation, so with a propagator, for example, localizes the interaction to just be in the neighborhood of, of, this, uh, of where the Wilson lines intersect. And this is kind of how the R matrix emerges from a normal quantum field theory. So the idea is that away from crossings, whenever two Wilson lines don't intersect, well, there are no interactions because you could always scale them away. So any diagram that you draw, I mean, I drew this between two, I drew this between two uh, Wilson lines, but equally, if I drew a diagram like this, I could scale it away. Um, so essentially what you have is some, if, you, if you're far away from where the Wilson lines cross, you have some free excitations in a particular representation, right? So your Wilson line is in some representation, um, let's say fundamental of SUN, if that's what you want. Um, and nothing happens. It just moves, the, the, this, this representation moves along. On the other hand, when you have crossing, the interactions, so I've drawn here the lowest order, and then there's a correction here. I hope you can see the red dot. That's meant to be the cubic interaction from the Chern-Simons coupling. Um, and, and this will, have, will localize at this uh, uh, intersection point. Um, and that's what the R matrix will be. OK, so I want to convince you that that actually happens. A very simple calculation. Let me just pause here, see if people have questions. So I, I'm going to calculate this first uh, diagram. So that's just a propagator. And the endpoints, right here is one endpoint, here's the second endpoint. Um, and I integrate over the position, and, and you know the endpoint is localized on a Wilson line. So this is just a one-dimensional integral. This is another one-dimensional integral. And this is the propagator that we calculate. So, you actually, in fact, only get the AX, XY component because of the way I've oriented my Wilson lines, just for simplicity. And here it is. You see, this is just the DZ bar derivative. So this is DZ bar derivative of one over R squared because we're in four dimensions, if you want. And now you just have to do this integral, right? This is a very simple integral. You, <laughs> all of you can do this. Um, just uh, switch to polar coordinates. Uh, and you end up with this factor of one over z1 minus z2, 
times, well, what do we end up with? Um, well, when you contract the, the um, group theory indices, uh, because this is the same propagator, right? So it has to have the same index at both ends. Uh, you just get the, the quadratic Casimir. And I hope maybe you remember this is precisely what the semi-classical R matrix of Grinfeld, the leading order correction to identity, was. So I suppose if you were studying a more complicated system, you could go ahead and compute higher order corrections. Um, but you get the semi-classical R matrix or the classical R matrix, I guess, um, just from this calculation. Now, how about the Young-Baxter equation? This, I think, is even nicer. So the Young-Baxter equation, remember, people have studied it really hard to try to figure out what are all its possible solutions. And, you know, generally, if you faced with, if you've given some R matrix to check that the Young-Baxter equation holds, I'm not saying it's a super difficult process, but <laughs> it is quite complicated. These matrices are quite large. It's the tensor product of three different vector spaces. So it's a lot of effort to check that they're, they, they're satisfied. But here, this is going to be quite easy, actually. So let's start with this configuration um, of three Wilson lines. And this one is sitting at position Z1. Remember, we're in four dimensions. So this Wilson line uh, goes through the WW bar directions and sits at a point in the, in the Z plane. So this one is sitting at the point Z1, this one's sitting at the point Z2, and this one's sitting at the point Z3. And I can move the Z2 guy however I want, right? It, the theory is topological in the WW bar plane. This is my WW bar plane. I'm writing XY, but it's the same as WW bar. So I can move it um, all the way, naively, I can move it all the way, for example, up to this point here. And then maybe I should worry, right? Maybe I'm just like in 3D churn Simon's theory, I'm not allowed to cross this point because that would change the topology. But this is just an illusion of this two dimensional graph. The whole thing lives in four dimensions. These lines are really in four dimensions and they sit at different points, Z1, Z2, and Z3 in the ZZ bar plane. So they, well, they're not actually physically on top of each other, they separate it. So you're perfectly okay to move this line all the way to the other side to end up with this configuration. And all of this is just relying on the topological nature of the theory in the WW bar. And that's it. That's your young Baxter. I think that's very elegant. Okay. Now, Let's uh, try to learn a little bit more. Okay, so that's, that's the simple lessons. We get the R matrix, we get the Young-Baxter equation. How about these funny representations that I told you about? So it turns out that the operator that you have in the exponential is not just uh, A times T times the generators, but it actually has a whole expansion in the polynomial ring um, in, valued in the Lie algebra. So, Polynomial ring is not a big deal, right? It just, you, you classically, what you would do is you would just say, okay, it's got the, the generators that I know from my Lie algebra, and then I multiply them by Zn, and the commutation relations for this thing are quite straightforward. We've all seen them, uh, for example, in a, in, a, in a current algebra, but the important thing here is there is no central, there is no a central term. It's just a classical algebra. This term is proportional to Zn. This term is proportional to Zm. So the right-hand side has got to be proportional to Zn plus n. And I claim that this is exactly the kind of thing that you need to have inside the Wilson, uh, the exponential of the Wilson operator, um, in order to have a well-defined quantum operator. So that's not uh, obvious, and I want to just say a little bit about how that happens. You know, you could just say, oh, I'm just going to start with an ordinary Wilson line and another ordinary Wilson line. And you could ask, okay, these are operators in my quantum theory. 
what does the OPE look like? Well, if you bring them close to each other, and I'm, I'm going to do the calculation for you just now, it turns out that they, they have a term in the OPE expansion which couples not just to A, but which couples to DZ of A. So that's why, even if you start it off with your normal Wilson line operators, you bring them together, the OPE will generate for you these weird higher corrections. How can you see that this is what happens? Well, I'll sketch here the calculation, but it would, be, it would take too long to, to do the whole thing. But you can think about taking two of these Wilson lines, so I've drawn them for some reason horizontally here, Right, here's one Wilson line, here's the second Wilson line, and I'm keeping them slightly apart, like I would in an OPE. And you can check that there is a non-zero coupling of these two Wilson lines to a source which is proportional to DZA. Okay. So how would you do that calculation? Well, again, it's just a simple Feynman diagram, right? Here, here you will see one propagator, here you see a second propagator, Here's one propagator, here's a second propagator, here's a source. And this is the one form omega, which comes from the interaction, right? So if we had some more fancy one form here, this would be a different one form, but here it's just dz. And what do I have to integrate over? Well, I have this red, um, I have this red point um, here, which, I, which is sitting in the bulk, and then I have two endpoints, one here and one here, which are just sitting in one direction. So you see the integration is over two real lines um, and uh, one copy of R4. We know what these propagators are. And so now it's just a relatively simple exercise to calculate it. And, and you might think naively when you first look at it, you might think naively you just get zero. But in fact, what you get is a dz derivative of a delta function. So basically what happens is this, this um, diagram is zero unless all three points coincide. When these three points coincide, then there is a singularity. What does that singularity look like? Or the integral is singular. It's the it turns out to be equal to the derivative of a delta function. Okay, great. We can integrate by parts and we just left with um, this integral just along uh, the Wilson line. So this I should, yeah, this is in the epsilon goes to zero. So hopefully what I've shown you, I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to check that this is indeed what happens when you have these two propagators, but it's, it's a short exercise. Um, you can ask me about it on Slack. But what I've hopefully shown you is that the Wilson line has got these higher corrections and you should recognize this now. This is precisely the, I'm going to call it the Drinfeld tail. Um, remember when we had these higher charges like Q1 acting on two particle states, so two Wilson lines, um, there was a Q1 tensor one piece um, and a one tensor Q1, whoops, sorry and a one tensor Q1 piece, but there was also an FABC piece Q0, Q0 uh, with local charges. So this is exactly the analog of that. So what you're trying to, so basically what happens is that when you bring these Wilson lines together, you start seeing the Yangian and you start seeing the non-local charges appearing in the exponent, not just the global symmetry. So in this sense, this theory really does have all these uh, integrable charges as part of its sort of conventional symmetries. Okay, so I'm hoping I have maybe another 10 minutes or so, maybe another five minutes is all I'm going to need. I guess I started a little bit late, so I hope that's okay. Yeah, you have uh, 10 minutes, I think. Perfect, thank you. Um, so. Uh, so like many theories, four-dimensional chain Simons theory potentially can have gauge anomalies. And that's what I wanted to talk about now. Um, just to briefly tell you a bit about what happens to Wilson lines, it turns out that these Wilson lines have the analog of this kind of framing anomaly um, that happens also in uh, 3D chain Simons theory. Uh, 
And here you see uh, if you have, uh, well, what is a gauge anomaly? Well, if you compute some correlator involving some gauge fields and you do a gauge transformation, um, then you're classically, of course, this should be, should give you the same answer, but sometimes the anomalies can mess up uh, this correlator and change the score. So just very briefly, um, this turns out to happen for the Wilson lines and you can, the Wilson lines I've been talking about so far were flat Wilson lines, but you could have asked, why didn't you consider curly Wilson lines? And indeed you can, but if you do, there's a price to pay. And that is that there is a framing anomaly. So this, this anomaly comes about from this kind of diagram. So you have some external source and you calculate uh, this, uh, this diagram. And when you change A, you change it by d of epsilon, then you get a different answer. So this d epsilon term turns out to give a non-zero uh, non answer. It's not a total derivative. Um, the, the calculation is quite analogous, just a, a little bit more involved, uh, but it's quite analogous to what we were doing um, uh, just now. Basically, you have one propagator, you have a second propagator, you change your source for a covariant d epsilon, you integrate by parts um, and you get a uh, singular contribution when all these three points u, v, and w in this diagram coincide. So, you know, you have to work a little bit harder, um, but it's, it's, it's basically just figuring out what are the singularities of the integrand. And you get an answer like this, where the Wilson line here is um, bent in the y direction, y is taken as a function of x, so y equal to a constant would be a perfectly straight Wilson line. Right? But if y is not constant, then you get this kind of correction. So you might think, okay, that's it, we're in trouble, right? You cannot have, the, these Wilson line operators are generically um, not good operators, but that's not true. It turns out you can compensate for this. Simply what it means is that you shouldn't put the Wilson line at the point z0, but you should, it should get a contribution. Um, it, should, it should not be at z0, but it should move the position, the location of the Wilson line should move depending on where you are on that Wilson line. So y, remember again, is a function of x. And when you do this calculation, you, it turns out that it's proportional to um, the quadratic Casimir. the gauge group. Um, and this is, turns out to be a really nice uh, result. So basically, you can, you can have a Wilson line that wiggles as long as its position in Z changes in this way, compensates in this way, and then that is a well-defined gauge invariant operator. You could ask, are there any other diagrams uh, that uh, are anomalous? And, and you can show that all is good uh, um, after that correction. Um, but here's, here's the nice thing. See, if I take a Wilson line that's just, move, that's just in this direction like this, and I rotate it by two pi, so I split up this diagram into two, two parts just so you see I'm rotating it. So I rotated it by pi in the first half, and then I rotated it by another pi in the second half. So that's doing this Lorentz boost that we talked about last time. And in the end, I end up with a perfectly straight line again. But because of this term, I will have to change my coordinate z, it's gonna to have to shift. And so this, this spectral parameter, the coordinate z, is gonna to have to shift by this amount. Now, I also introduced last time around this evaluation representation for the Yangian, where all the higher charges, where I wrote them, I think, with a un factor, were proportional to q0, so that was this evaluation representation that Drinfeld had, where he said, give me a representation of the Lie algebra. If it satisfies certain conditions, then it'll also be a representation of the Yangian, but I will set all the Yangian charges to zero. And he said, okay, that's one representation, but if we boost it, if we use this boost automorphism, we get these evaluation representations. And in particular, what I'm showing you is that this framing anomaly is equivalent to this boost 
because the first non-local charge, right, in the evaluation representation gets shifted by this amount here. So the first non-local charge in the boosted, uh, in the evaluation representation looks like this. But that's precisely the condition that the boost, when it acts on Q1, just gives you an extra Q0. Right, so when the boost acts on the first non-local charge, remember, Drinfeld always had this construction, it just gives you Q0. I showed you how this comes out of the Sigma model, and we're seeing it come out uh, here as well. So let me just finish up now. Roughly speaking, I've shown you that the R matrix, the Young-Baxter equation, um, as well as these, these uh, uh, higher charges, these Jungian higher charges, are all sort of built into the Wilson lines of this four-dimensional quantum Chern's sphere. Okay, good. So I think I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Bogdan. Very nice. So are there any questions? Uh, I will ask a question then. Yes, please, Oda. So, uh, so, so, can we compute some kind, some kind of like a knot invariance using this holomorphic chain Simon theory by considering some like a knotted Wilson line? Well, in general, you see, if you have just a Wilson line that's a circle, that's actually not a good Wilson, uh, not a good quantum operator, mm -hmm. because as you're moving along this Wilson line, you come back to the same point and the spectral parameter then should be different oh, because see, of this framing I anomaly. I see. Now, <laughs> I don't know uh, uh, where this, the following comment is going to lead, but sometimes, as you know, uh, the, the quadratic, um, uh, sorry, the um, dual coxeter number is zero, in particular right. at zero for PSU224, that will appear in the superstring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So nothing stopping you from from doing something like that there, um, but I'm really not sure what it would mean. That's a nice question. I see, that's interesting. Does the Wilson loop represent gauge invariance? So the Wilson loop um, doesn't represent gauge invariance, but it's a gauge invariant operator. So if you were just a, an ordinary gauge theory, you know, perturbative gauge theory person, um, like doing Feynman diagrams, you know, or even just quantum field theory guy, you might ask, what are the operators which are invariant in this theory, which are, which are well-defined in this theory, gauge invariant? And you wouldn't necessarily think of Wilson lines because they're a weird operator, right? You would typically try to think of some localized plane wave solutions, like you do for a photon in QED or something like that. But it turns out that on top of the these local operators, you can have non-local operators, uh, which are which are these Wilson lines. So they uh, these Wilson loops. So Wilson loops are well studied in, in normal gauge theories. They're just a bunch of other operators which the quantum field theory has. And in fact, in the Chern-Simons theory, um, there are no there are no other operators. There are no local operators, and all you have is these Wilson line operators. Um, well, almost all, uh, and uh, in, in 4D churn Simons, we have these slightly generalized uh, operators, which extend all the way to plus and minus infinity, um, and which have these slightly unusual properties that I reviewed here. Hope that answers the question. Um, if, you, if you do a weak rotation in the ZZ bar plane and you go to Minkowski there, can you have Wilson lines now that are uh, uh, that move in that direction, that go in the z bar direction at fix z and x and y? Well, I think the reason I didn't want to have Wilson lines there is because there is no a uh, z component to the connection. Right, but then there's a z, a z bar. Is, is, it an, is there an a z bar? There is an a z bar. Right? There is an a z bar, yeah. So if, in, if I'm in Minkowski, I could, I could move in that light cone direction. I could, have, could I have light like lines in that direction? But I still only have like a light, so it would be some kind of light like Wilson line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it could still cross with others in the XY plane. I don't know if there is any interest, anything interesting there. Maybe, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, 
I'm, I'm not sure about that. Is, is there any reason why you? <laughs> not just the existence of UAZ, but it's just a curiosity. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, so I, I don't want to sound discouraging, but uh, it doesn't seem like the. Thanks. Um, can I also ask a question? Um, so, in, in recently, uh, in these paper by Cyberg and collaborators, they um, introduced these notions of higher form symmetries under which the Wilson lines and general gauge theories are natural operators. So, um, can I understand these framing anomalies also in the language of these generalized symmetries? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is just the the kind of anomaly. This framing anomaly exists also in three D churn Simon's theory. When you have when you have these knots, these knots have got to be these Wilson lines. Like, but I, I mean, I, I suppressed all that discussion, but they've got to be actually framed um, uh, loops rather than just loops. And so there's there's a framing anomaly already there. Um, I guess if, uh, I mean, because these are, you're thinking of these things being localized, right? Of these generalized symmetries being localized. Um, it, it sounds, it sounds similar. I, I just, I haven't thought about, I haven't thought about that very much. So but may, maybe I'll have a little think and then post something on Slack. Uh, okay. okay, thanks. Okay, I do not see any further questions. So let's thank Bogdan again, and uh, we meet uh, in uh, we meet again in uh, forty five minutes from now. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I'll have.